our speaker this week is Dr. Ruben Mamani. He is our Fulbright Scholar in Residence. And we're very excited to have him. It's actually really rare and special that we have someone participating in the Fulbright program uh, here with us this, uh, at St. Francis, which is great. So Ruben has a PhD from the University of Connecticut. Well, it depends on your perspective. But it's pretty good. I went to UMass, so. Right. Also a master's in science from UConn, and a bachelor's in chemical engineering from University of Tennessee. So he's very highly credentialed. Um, he was, in addition to being the Fulbright Scholar here, he was the director of operations for a nonprofit called Engineers in Action. Some of you might be familiar with that organization. Um, he was also a faculty member in the Environmental Engineering Department of the Catholic University of Bolivia. And frankly, his resume is so long that it would take the rest of his time to just tell you about it. So I'm going to move on. So Ruben is going to be talking to us about his work at the Global Atmospheric Watch uh, Station in Bolivia. So please give a warm St. Francis welcome to our own Dr. Mamani. Well, thanks. Uh uh, Joe, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, sorry for my English. If I, if you need me to speak louder, just tell me. I'll get even more louder. But uh, today I came basically to kind of show you uh, where is Bolivia, kind of general views of Bolivia, and also about the uh, Global Atmospheric Watch uh, uh, Research Station in Chacaltaya in Bolivia. So I'm going to show you some videos first, like five minutes and another one of three minutes, and then I'll give you a presentation of the, of the uh, station, okay? And the history of the station. So it's in Spanish. I didn't find the one in English, so just if you can, it has some, uh, some like descriptions of things like that. more or less the biodiversity in Bolivia, but then the environmental problems that also we have there. more in the southern part where the deserts are and then you, the other part with the forest is basically the Amazon part of Bolivia but this one is more in the desert Bolivia has one of the highest reserves of lithium for like, batteries, so that's one they were showing. And a lot of income comes from natural gas. We have a lot of natural gas, and we export that to Brazil and Argentina.
Uh, this is La Paz, and this is one, one of the capitals. Uh, this is Potosí, I think. Well, So in the major cities, you can see how trash is generated, no? and that's one, the contrast no? that we have. So it's a lot of contamination. It's one of the countries that has a lot of deforestation also going on in the Amazon, so that's, that's a problem. <coughs> yeah, and many rivers are contaminated. And uh, the ones that went to Bolivia, I guess there was a group from St. Francis, you know, they went to the mining area of Bolivia where there was some issues with uh, mining pollution. Now we're going to talk, well, we're going to see this a small video about the, um, this is where the research station is. This is called uh, Chacaltaya, it's like a mountain. And for many years, the university in Bolivia, the San Andres University, has been uh, uh, doing research there. So this is the inauguration day. So you can see how uh, they were like putting the equipment to monitor uh, pollutants air pollutants, so they, this is like the inauguration day. Do you know what, what he was saying? Anybody very understood? Very important scientific information for the international and national community. Yeah, it's very important to have scientific data to provide to the politicians, to all the people that are you know, regarded about this environmental problem. So that's one of the reasons that he was talking. He's Paolo, I don't really remember his name, but he's from Italy. So this research station was put together with many countries. Many countries and many universities kind of put their different uh, uh, apparatus no? For, to measure different kinds of pollutants. Yeah, this is measuring CO2, no? and then uh, ozone. Black carbon. Todos los datos que sacará esta estación pueden servir para alimentar modelos <coughs> climáticos, es decir, previsiones del clima a 20, 30 años. Okay. Uh, this, the guy that was talking is uh, Dr. Francesco Sarati. He's also from Italy, but he, he lives in Bolivia for over 30 years. And he was saying that all this data that they are getting now, they can be used, the data can be used for climate models, not to kind of see how climate will be uh, behaving in the next 30, 50 years. Porque 
estamos en una parte de la cordillera donde sufrimos el proceso de derretimiento acelerado de los glaciares. Aquí toda esta montaña era un glaciar que se ha perdido, el glaciar de Chacaltaya, sobre todo en la parte de atrás. Y otros glaciares se van a perder con el tiempo, ¿por qué? Porque son vulnerables, son pequeños, están cerca a centros habitados, hay una serie de calentamiento global también, hay una serie de motivos. En especial nosotros creemos que el efecto que tienen los aerosoles, estas partículas que son transportadas en la atmósfera desde regiones como la Amazonía, por ejemplo, cuando hay quemas de, de, de bosques o de chaqueos, como decimos acá, entonces material como cenizas, como humo, es transportado y puede depositarse en los glaciares y hacer que los glaciares se vuelvan más oscuros y absorban más la radiación. Ok, uh, just I'm going to summarize what he was saying, no? He's saying that uh, the idea of having the station on, at this altitude, because you can see all the snow-capped mountains, is because uh, about 20, 30 years ago there was a uh, glaciers on the top of the mountains, but uh, these are permanent glaciers, but now because of climate change they are like receding. No? And one of the reasons is because of temperature. Temperature is getting warmer, but also another uh, hypothesis is probably aerosols. Aerosols are like uh, uh, smoke, no? a smoke or black carbon that comes from uh, different sources. Maybe it can come from cars, from diesel cars, but also can, can come from uh, <coughs> uh, fires, no? combustion fires from the forest. In this case would be maybe, maybe the Amazon forest where there's like seasonal fires and those, that smoke can be brought and then can also cause some of the glaciers to, to, uh, to melt. So the idea of having that research station is basically looking into that. This is about, I, I would think, like yeah, close to 19,000 feet. The, the station. It's very, very difficult to breathe. It's really. Uh, um, So I'm going to give you more or less like a story of why the station was uh, what started, no? So basically, uh, the station is called GO, Global Atmospheric Watch. And uh, it's Chacaltaya, it's 5,240 meters above the sea level. So if you, you can convert to feet, multiply by three, no? Three point something, that gives you the altitude in feet. And this is the latitude and the longitude, I think, yeah. And uh, these are the universities that are supporting this station. We also have some people from NASA, and there's some people from Sweden, from, from Germany, and uh, other universities no, there that are helping. Um, OK, a uh, general introduction of Bolivia, we can also the video, this is South America, and Bolivia is in the middle. But a, a, along South America, you have the Andes Mountains, which, is, which are the second tallest mountains in the world after the Himalayas. The Himalayas are the highest, and the second highest are the, the, the Andes. And the Andes cross Bolivia here. No? And in Bolivia, they divide into two ranges. And in between the ranges, there's the highlands or the altiplano. And La Paz, the capital, is located in the highlands. So it's around here. No? Um, there's like a million square kilometers of area that Bolivia has. And it's about the size of Texas, New Mexico, California. It's one fifth of the US, the continental US. No? And there are major cities. The three major cities are La Paz, Cochabamba, Santa Cruz. They are here. One is in the highlands, one is in the valleys, and one is in the lowlands. No? And about where I live is 1.7 million people living there. And this is like a comparison of the highlands, the, the elevation change. You see what's really high, and then the lowlands are really here. If we talk about Loreto, Loreto is kind of this, this, this elevation. No? <laughs> So these this mountains are really, really high. Yeah, so it's, the water boils at 89 Celsius because the atmospheric pressure is half of what it is here. 
So your body will tend to like swell it, swell it, no? Um, so those are some special conditions at that altitude. So if we go further, we zoom in. This is the city, La Paz and El Alto. It's just like a big uh, scar, no? Into the mountains. And the station is around here. Even though it seems small, once you start zooming it, it, it's really big. It has a lot of canyons and things like that. There's about 17 kilometers from here to here. Uh, that's probably 10 miles. No, yeah, more or less. But why this, they, they, we are studying uh, smoke and all, all, all of these uh, problems is because in the lowlands of Bolivia, there's a lot of uh, uh, biomass burning a lot of smoke is generated, and because of the winds, this smoke comes to the highlands. And, and this is being observed over many, like in 2010, you can see all this smoke coming through the, through the, through the highlands, and they creep, kind of creep flow, going up to the mountains. No? This is from a satellite, it's called MODIS, uh, that is uh, basically taking pictures of, of the Earth. You can see this creep flow, no? like kind of going up and then going through the, to the high, high mountains. And this, this thing is the Titicaca Lake. I don't know if you ever see, it's one of the highest lakes in the world that you can see. It's like an inland sea. That's another one. Well, we were kind of surprised to see this because you wouldn't think that there's so much smoke and then it would go over and then come to the highlands, no? But you can see that, yeah, the smoke really gets there. And this is like where the biomass or the, where the deforestation occurs. A lot of people start burning the forest so they can clear the, the fields to, to grow uh, sugar cane, cotton, or soybean, corn. So. It's just like they clear big stations of land so they can start growing all these crops. No? And this is not just Bolivia, it's also uh, Brazil and the north part of Argentina. So th this is what, it, what I'm saying, biomass burning in all of Eastern South America. So all of these red, red dots that you see are the uh, uh, heat, heat spots, no? that's where probably there is a fire going on in all of this. And that's where the smoke is being produced. And the smoke, what, what do they produce? Basically black carbon or absorbing aerosols. And what happens is when you have black carbon, uh, they can be transported and then deposit into the uh, glaciers or ice, and they can change the albedo of the surface of, of glaciers or, or, or the white uh, like surface, no? Do you know anybody who, what's the albedo? Did you have any concept of albedo? Well, albedo is basically, let me write it down. Um, yeah. There's a marker on the left here, Ruben. Where? Uh, another side okay. of the screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, albedo is, is this, albedo, no? And basically, albedo in, in layman's terms is reflectivity. And the value can go from close to zero to one. No? So basically, it's a percentage of how reflective is a surface. No? So if you have uh, the light of the sun, and if it's, it has almost the albedo close to one, it never is, is really one, probably zero 090 in the eyes. So then the albedo would, uh, basically the light would reflect because the albedo is high, no? And then, but if you have aerosol, which are tiny dots of black, they are depositing on the ice or the snow, we can say, then the light will just not, not uh, reflect. It will be absorbed and it becomes in thermal energy. So that, that makes it it's melt faster, no? So that's, that's more or less the, the, the idea of the albedo. And this could cause, you know, a, a positive climate force. Yeah. 
yeah, that's another addition for aerosols. And this is a, a, a study done in, uh, for Rabatel about all the glaciers in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, and how they change uh, over the years, since 1970 to 2010, how they've been retreating, you know, very, very dramatically, almost all of them, you know. And this, this one, this one, and that one is Bolivia, you know. And you have all these glaciers. So this is not just happening in one glacier, it's happening in all of them. And this is uh, basically Chacaltay in 2010, where we started to do initial measurements. This is a Moody impactor to collect particles that then we look into the microscope. And here I am, and this is another colleague, Marcos Andrade, the director of the center. So here's where we are collecting some um, uh, ambient air to see uh, also the aerosols that are inside. So then we did an initial uh, some some uh, sampling on that. We cannot look into periods where there were there was uh, biomass burning and and also periods where there was no biomass burning, no? a clean time, a clean period, and also a, a, a time where there was more smoke. No? And we actually got more uh, particles and more mass during those times. And this is a TEM, a transmission electron microscope of these particles in the last stage of 0.18 microns. Basically, the soot are more like fractal-like uh, particles. No? This this size is from this size from here to here is one micron. Do you know what is a, a micron? A one micron is the <coughs> million size of a millimeter uh, of a meter. So it's really really small. It's from the hair size probably a thousand smaller, a thousand less than the, the, the hair, hair uh, width. No? So you really need an electron microscope to observe all of these particles. And you see some of, some of these. And most of these come from combustion, from biomass burning, from cars, from diesel, from all of these. No? And they, and uh, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, the main room at the Chacaltaya station. It has different instruments to measure aerosols, CO2, has a meteorological station. And these are some of the uh, equipment they have to measure different stuff, like here CO2, methane, uh, Picaro, a thermometer, a thermometer. I'm not going to go into detail, no? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the class that I'm going to teach in uh, next semester, I will be talking more about the instruments, okay? Um, this is the view of Chacaltaya. You can basically see, uh, you are kind of on top of the world and then you see everything behind, you know, below. So you see all the other mountains below and the city. And it's really cold, it's, it's hard to work there. Um, in Bolivia we have two types of seasons, the dry and wet season, not really uh, the co uh, like winter, spring, and, and fall. Uh, for us, winter is from May to August, but it's called the dry season. This is dry season, there's not much rain, this is precipitation. And the rainy season starts in September, October, and then it actually is really good on December, January, February, and then starts kind of falling down again. But that's more or less our, our, uh, our seasons there. So we have this kind of dry, dry, and then we have wet. These are some general observations of a black carbon. When we have a wet conditions, most of the rain basically uh, cleans the aerosols. So basically, you would see this, that it's kind of clean. But when there is not, uh, no water, no humidity, then you'll see all these peaks of black carbon. No? Uh, in actuality, and this is kind of interesting, is uh, aerosols or black carbon uh, are needed also. There, it's not just they are a pollutant. Of course, they are a pollutant, but they are needed for rain to happen. Because if you have humidity, and if you don't have aerosols, the, uh, the humidity needs something like a surface to, to condensate. But if you don't have that, then you don't have anything to rain. So that's, that's a, 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 it's kind of, there's a two sides of the issue, no? So this, this black, uh, the carbon actually can serve as a 
cloud condensation nuclei. That's something we, we also uh, look into this uh, science, no? that they can interact with clouds and, and form uh, rain. Yeah, so then there is this more, more graphs. And then there's this instrument called SMPS that counts particles uh, of different sizes. And then you can get this um, data based on, on the types, the sizes of the particles, and also the, uh, how many of those particles are. Uh, let me see if I can. This is at different hours of the day and the diameter of the particle. This is in logarithmic scale, which is 100 nanometers, 500 nanometers. Uh, 500 nanometers is like half of a micrometer. So it's, it's really, these are really, really tiny, tiny particles. These are some size distribution for 10 to 30 nanometers, 30 to 100, 100 to 500. Uh, this is with different years. So these are some initial data that this uh, research station is, is providing no? for the last uh, three years, 2012, 2013, 2014, for a number of particles. Some daily behaviors. Uh, these are different modes for particles, nucleation bet between 10 and 30 nanometers, Iken, 30 to 100, and accumulation mode 100 to 500. And uh, what times of the day they are more present, you can see the yellow, the orange, you know, the orange uh, lines, so that's when you have the most concentration of these particles. some creation events. But what is this important is basically with all this data, what you are kind of learning is how, what is the dynamics of this uh, environment? We have not just biomass burning from, from, the, uh, from, the bio, from the Amazon, but we have also other sources of aerosol, like the city, like La Paz, the big city has a lot of vehicles, cars. So then the pollution from the city might also be going to, to the, to the station. So then you have all kinds of interaction. No? So all these particles and peaks, they kind of help you some way, somehow detect where, where the pollutants are coming, no? or what is the history of the, of the transport of the pollution. And uh, let me see what else we can show you. Well, this is more uh, of color. Yeah, where are they coming from? For looking at where things are coming from, you have to look at uh, masses of air. So some people can do back trajectory models of how air moves. Like if, if the air is here today, if I can do a back trajectory saying 12 hours ago or like two days ago where the air was, you know, based on meteorology, you know, with all the air mass and all of that. So basically, basically that's what the back trajectory models that they do that. You know? And then uh, you can see the, uh, this, this is where Chacaltaya is. And then you kind of look around and, and start uh, looking at the trajectories, no? where, where you have all these uh, uh, masses of air bringing the aerosols coming from. And then with wind roses, I don't know if you ever, have you heard of wind roses? Wind roses? Yeah, so we'll, we'll also learn that in the next semester. It's basically, wind rose is a, like a summary of uh, where the air or the wind comes from and the frequency of the wind over a period of time, maybe over a month, over a year. So in this case, it tells you, okay, most of the wind, here's the north, here's the south, uh, the, oh, I think this is the east and the west. No, so it, it kind of tells you from what direction the wind is usually prevalent. No? And then with this, you can kind of see where where your air is coming from. So with this analysis, you cannot more or less use these uh, back trajectory models and then kind of see where, from where the, the particles or aerosols are coming from and what times. No? And then you have all these studies that they do you know, at different uh, periods and, and see where, where the air is coming from. And it would change depending on the season. Maybe in the winter is different than the summer, and also during the time of the day. No? 
and also where it will go later. So this is kind of interesting because this is Chacaltaya, and in winter, most of the air will come from the west, no? West. And in summer, most of the air will come from the east, a little bit from the southwest. No? So meaning that in the winter, when the, it's dry, most of the air or aerosols also will come not from the Amazon, but they will, it will come from the Altiplano, from the highlands. So that kind of, you can start kind of looking into that. No? And in the summer, yeah, you will have more coming from the Amazon area. So that kind of gives you some, some idea of how, how the dynamics of the transport of uh, aerosols and the metrology is. No? Also, something very important in each area when you're looking at, at, at all of this is not just the winds, but also the topography, the presence of mountains. Because if you have mountains, uh, they act like walls. So then that also will have uh, something to do with how uh, the air is transported. Uh, besides that, uh, the, the laboratory has done field work in the city to measure pollutants in the city and uh, at the airport and also downtown. So they measure um, a, in the urban background also in the near the source where the source for us is basically vehicles. So they measure CO and black carbon. And an interesting day is the census day. A census day is when everyone has to stay at home, nobody drives. So that day basically doesn't have any cars moving. So you can see here, no? There's like almost zero CO and zero black carbon. No? So that, that's a perfect day to do some experiments. No? That, that, you know, first you have all kinds of uh, peaks and then suddenly the whole day is like <laughs> nothing. So, so this is kind of a general idea, no? What uh, what they were measuring, like CO, O2, CO, CO2, particle number. Well, also they are, they have measured particles uh, gr uh, less than 10 microns, which is called PM10, and they are looking into the concentrations, the metal concentrations. Uh, these are some preliminary results, basically of. This is elemental black carbon in La Paz and El Alto too. Uh, you can see at six o'clock, uh, the peak starts going up. And at 10, 12, it come, goes down. And then again, at six o'clock in the afternoon, it goes up. Do you know why, why this is? This is basically the traffic. No? When you have so much cars or people going to work, whoosh, this goes up. And when people go home, again, no? And this is less, no? it's still going up, but not that much. But this is, yeah, shows the sources of pollutants, which would be cars, no, in this case. No? So to, to, to finalize, basically, um, that we, we basically saw, saw strong episodes of biomass burning, no? Or smoke in the Andean region, and they can be observed, observed from satellite, satellites, no? So this station was set up in December 2011, and now it's working since then continuously, and it's measuring aerosol properties, gases, uh, greenhouse and reactive concentrations and meteorology, and other parameters. And there's always like scientists from other countries that come and do a specific uh, research work. So some of them are measuring isotopes or some uh, specific compounds that they want to see, you know, on the on the on this uh, place. And um, there's a clear sign, signal of uh, transport of air masses during the biomass burning season. And there's a, sig a signature no, of air arriving from the city at Chacaltaya. And and the planetary boundary la layer plays an important role in transporting polluted air from the metropolitan area, but it's not the only factor. Also, they have, uh, there's an observation of new particle formation uh, and the transport of large particles uh, from biomass burning is observed, you know, so we can verify that. 
and in the area, uh, through the year, the pollution from cars, it's always there. So it's not, uh, it, it, will be, it will go up and down during the different parts of the year, but you can see that it's always present. You know? uh, regarding biomass, uh, it's more like uh, interannual variability. Okay. All right, so that would be the end. <laughs> this is the LIDAR. There's a laser from the, uh, the university, and I guess they, they took the picture like that. <laughs> So please uh, ask our speakers some questions. Do you have any? Uh, yes. How did you guys work with the city? Like, did you guys to get everyone to not drive for a whole day? That takes a massive amount of effort. Yeah, that's we didn't have to do anything. Really, the city no, was it's like, like the census is when they take account of people, how many people live in each home. So it was mandated by the government. So, so it was already in place. Yes. So they to took advantage it. of that. Okay. Yeah. I was like, because that's, that's no, 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 we didn't do anything. I was like, getting that to happen, that's no. amazing. No. <laughs> yes. Can you, like, like, focus on uh, air, like air quality as, like, in your schooling? Like, did you get your doctorate in, like, air quality and whatnot? What, 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 what again? Did you get your, like, doctorate in, like, air quality? Is that, like... I, I, I have a doctor. No, I have a... PhD in air pollution, but I focus on, no, a PhD in environmental engineering, but I focus on air pollution. Okay. But I, I think in, uh, for air pollution and air quality, you can be either civil engineer, or environmental, or chemical, or even mechanical, because a lot of times you need to know a lot of combustion, you know, combustion, how it has to reduce uh, the, 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 the pollutants. But um, yeah, in environmental, chemical, and civil, yeah you can get that specialization on air, air quality. And it's also very, very related to public health too, because there are many studies that relate like uh, how people are exposed to pollutants. So then there are like studies where they put like uh, samplers to kids in the school. So they, they go to buses and during the day how, how they are exposed to these pollutants. And they found out that while buses are just um, waiting and still on, that's where they generate more, more emissions. No? So things like that. So it's better just to turn it off. No? Things like that. No? Yeah. Yes. Um, are there any like government regulations now with like vehicle emissions? Um, are you seeing any changes or trends over time? In Bolivia or in the U.S.? Bolivia. Bolivia. That's one big, big problem because we have a good, um, we have a law. We have an environmental law. And it has standards for PM10. But that's from the 1990s. And it's kind of weird because most of the laws were copied from the EPA here, from, from, from the US. No? And in the EPA, they were more and more stringent. Now, instead of PM10, there is PM2.5 because they get to the lungs, and even PM1. But in Bolivia, the laws just stay at PM10. So there's a need for changing the regulations for the laws to PM2.5. But the other problem is we don't monitor. We don't really monitor. And in the cities, there's some monitoring, but there's no enforcement. There's no enforcement to like whoever is, uh, can, uh, can, can control this. No? There is, uh, uh, right now, they're starting like uh, voluntary um, emissions tests. In, in La Paz, in the big city. So if you have a car, you can go to this uh, laboratory, and you can do it voluntarily. And they give you a, like, a, a, like the results and tell you how your car is doing. You know? In many cases, you can uh, change uh, or do some maintenance on the car to make sure it doesn't emit that much. You know? But that's the, probably the, the closest they got to, more, to kind of have testing emissions. You know? The other thing is changing completely technology. No, uh, there's more like zero emission technology, and there's a lot of talk about electric cars. Since we have lithium in Bolivia, uh, they were saying, "Oh, well, we can make cars in Bolivia made of uh, el electric uh, batteries," but we don't have the technology. So then that needs to happen with maybe a partnership with another uh, company or a government. You know, they were talking with Korea or China or things like that. So.
Yes. Just out of curiosity, what kind of cars do they drive? Oh, the, re the same cars here, it's just like uh, gasoline and uh, diesel. Uh, there's some natural gas cars, there's no natural gas. The issue now is if you, have a, if you want to import a, a car that is more than two years old, uh, you cannot do it. Now the law doesn't allow you to get like an old car in the country. So you really have to kind of import a new car. Because you know? uh, I think that helps a little bit. You know? but. If you have a 30-year-old car, uh, you can still <laughs> drive it in Bolivia. Nobody really cares. Like if you bought it th 30 years ago, yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Well, thank you.